hear you, especially for that part of our service and others too. Kenner uh, Fishman, Yishar Kocheich to you, the wonderful, beautiful davening. <clears throat> to Joe Fuchs for the terrific Torah reading, appreciative. Yes, Yashikoch and to Lois. I've heard you uh, chant a number of Haftarot over the years, and so I'm always deeply impressed by your exactitude and uh, just the wonderful way that you're able to present the verses from the books of the prophets in these Haftarot. So I thank you as well, and it's really great to, to hear you do that once again. So Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Uh, even though I did recently <clears throat> finish watching the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy with one of our children, who will remain nameless to protect the innocent, usually my answer to a question that starts, did you see this or that movie, is a quick no. For as many holes as I have in the list of books I want to and should have read by now, that list of movies is longer. I won't trouble you with some of the gaps in my movie knowledge, but to anyone who loves cinema, they would be disconcerting. To Rabbi Steinhardt's eternal chagrin, the list even includes The Big Lebowski. But at least I know some of the titles that I should find the time to sit through. And from what I hear of this one, one of those films might be Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Which is at least the name of a film that came to mind when thinking about a Purim message for today. Wait, you ask, was in Purim yesterday and not today? Well, yes and no. It's not quite too late for a Purim message, as today is technically Shushan Purim, the day the holiday is celebrated in cities that are considered to have been walled from ancient days, including most notably Jerusalem. Now, admittedly, when Shushan Purim falls out on Shabbat, Jerusalem also reads the Megillah on Friday. But on the calendar, today is actually Shushan Purim. So let me tell you three ways that I learned to stop worrying and like Purim more than I used to, which is to share three problems I have with this day of levity costumes and hamantashen, or the way that the holiday has been interpreted and observed, and to share how I was saved from fixating on these troubling aspects of this strange and beloved holiday. Here's the first. It's a concept mentioned in the Talmud known as Ad Delo Yada, until you do not know, often contracted into one word, Ad Delo Yada. In the Talmud's expression, a person must drink until he cannot tell the difference between cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordechai. Now this crowd knows that there is such a thing as pshat and drash, the direct meaning of a text and its more expansive interpretation. While this is used normally for biblical verses, some would apply a similar concept here. Because the pshat of Ad Delo Yada is to get pretty drunk indeed. How blitzed would a person have to be to consider Haman and Mordechai to be interchangeable or pretty much the same? We are talking animal house levels. By the way, another movie I have never seen. And it is ultimately an instruction that is taken too seriously or too literally by too many people. While it can be harmless in the right and safest circumstances to let go for a night or a day, we know also that it can be embarrassing, even shameful. It can, and make no mistake, it has led to verbal and even physical altercation and abuse. This practice has confused children who witness copious alcohol consumption as somehow integral to Jewish observance. Purim intoxication has been a step, not the sole cause, 
but a step along the road toward those predisposed to addiction, having that condition take hold. And for those struggling with addiction and in recovery to suffer relapse. You may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. All because of the connection between alcohol and Purim observance. Adlo Yada has been interpreted, and like some verses in the Torah itself, it has been interpreted by some almost out of existence. Some say it means drink until you can't do the gematria, until you can't calculate the numerical value of the letters in blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman in your head. I can barely do that sober. Some say that it means to drink until you get tired and fall asleep when you won't be thinking about these matters. Others say it is when you can't pinpoint whether the world gets better with the removal of evil or the achievement of blessing. Fortunately, much of the Jewish world has, after long sweeping it under the rug, acknowledged the reality of addictive behavior and the medical component of addiction itself including but by no means limited to alcoholism. And some progressive and even some traditional communities have made great strides. Our neighbors at Boca Raton Synagogue among them in minimizing or eliminating alcohol from congregational Purim observances altogether. During Rabbi Steinhardt's Torah introduction, a line from a movie that I think I saw a long time ago, but barely remember, came to mind. That line is from Casablanca. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she had to walk into mine. Something like that. And my thought was of all the rabbis and all of the commentaries and all the books that could be selected uh, for a Torah introduction to Parsha Tetzaveh, Rabbi Steinhardt chose Rabbi Abraham Tversky, who I'm also mentioning in the context, not of his Torah commentaries, but his extraordinary work on addiction, both generally and teaching and awakening the Jewish world to be more attentive to this great challenge. And I'm glad he did, because maybe if you hear the name a few times, you'll be curious enough to look him up after Shabbat and read of some of his influence, some of his books either on Judaism or on addiction. And as the rabbi mentioned, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky died just a few weeks ago on January 31st. He was 90 after having battled COVID. I don't remember meeting him here in Boca but I do remember meeting him once and hearing him teach at a conference at JTS over 20 years ago on Jews and addiction. It inspired me to maintain interest and learn more, having since attended seminars at recovery centers, reading up on the subject and spearheading a weekly AA meeting at B'nai Torah, just as many congregations have opened their doors to the recovery community. For those who doubt, and some do, whether a synagogue is a place for addicts in various stages of recovery, Dr. Tversky has an answer. <clears throat> Recovering alcoholics, Tversky observed, will often exhibit a sense of responsibility far superior to that of the non-alcoholic in relationship to their families, friends, and God. And that has been my experience as well with the addicts I have come to know and also to be inspired by. Because the Jewish community now better addresses addiction, recognizes it for what it actually is, and affirms programs like the 12 Steps in part because a Hasidic rabbi, an expert in the field did so for decades, I'm for a fun and responsible Purim celebration. My second Purim challenge is that if you look closely at the 10 chapter scroll, it reads almost as a manual that could be titled, What to Expect 
when you live in the diaspora. The Megillah is most famous for having no mention of God in it, but it could just as easily be recognized that there is barely a mention of Israel. And the only reference to the Holy Land is that Mordechai is described as the descendant of someone who was exiled from Israel to Babylonia. This is a veritable flashing red light calling us to stop and consider the place of Israel on the one hand and everywhere else on the other, according to the author of this biblical story. What happens in the diaspora, according to the Megillah, you might think you have been accepted, even that you have made it, that you have achieved positions of power, and you might think this elevated status is permanent. You might be invited to the best parties, hang out with your Persian neighbors, and feel that you have planted roots, that you are home. But it is an illusion. Everything can change, and change faster than you can say 10,000 talents of silver, which is how much Haman promised to deposit into the royal treasury for permission to annihilate the Jews of the land. It would take, well, it would take a miracle to survive for any length of time. And the unstated but not so subtle subtext is that Jews cannot be safe unless they are in Israel. Well, even there, they might not always be safe, but at least they are actually home. And living as we do in our diaspora communities, referring specifically to the United States and Canada, they're not so dissimilar to what I described about Persia and Shushan, which I imagine as the Boca Raton of the area. And so this message hits us in a sensitive spot because we do feel very much at home. We have for generations. We know we are blessed to live here. And we know that to live only in fear of the next uprising, the next Proud Boys rally or attack, the next demagogue who for his or her own purposes looks for a scapegoat for other problems and shortcomings and finds those who have played that part before. We know that is no way to build a vibrant and energized community. Of course, we recognize that even here, there are Purim-like uncertainties. Yet we can also affirm that this extended chapter of Jewish history in North America has been one of the most productive periods of our millennia-long and continuing Jewish run. The three A's do loom here, assimilation, anti-Semitism, apathy, but so do abundant blessings and ample opportunity for serious engagement in the project of Jewish achievement and contribution to every significant national and human endeavor. So yes, fear of diaspora living is a subtext of the story of Esther and Mordechai. But if it calls us to be reminded not only of worries and insecurities, but blessings and still to be achieved potential, we can triumph over the ways this theme might otherwise trouble us. A seriously disconcerting storyline of the Megillah is not what almost happened to us, but what we are purported to have done to them. Which is that instead of they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. Purim is they tried to kill us. We sent a beautiful Jewish woman to sacrifice her body to expose the plans of our enemies and gain influence with the king. We won. Let's kill them. Esther's total dedication, heroism, and demonstrated strength is beyond doubt, yet it should still bother us. And it is the end of the story that begins with her bravery that might bother us just as much. In fact, most people who know the basics of the contents of the Megillah do not know this one. 
and the text is specific, 10 of Haman's sons, 800 non-Jews of Shushan, and 75,000 of their foes in the rest of the provinces were done away with. They were killed by the Jews of the kingdom. Some say it was self-defense. The direct reading of the Megillah is that this was revenge because the Jews were finally allowed to do to them what they had always wanted to do to us. Which is why it is a blessing to know that this is a fictional account fueled by suppressed fear and projected rage. Of course it crosses the mind of a generally powerless people to think about what we would do if only we could. What victim does not imagine what would be immediately satisfying about seeing your enemy suffer, how they made you suffer? But as we know, after revenge comes living with its aftermath. In the words of Elliot Ness in The Untouchables, a movie I did see a couple times and like very much, I have broken every law I have sworn to uphold. I have become what I beheld and I am content that I have done right. Content in the moment, perhaps. But in the long run, we will never be content with vengeance. Becoming what we despise and engaging in or condoning destruction of life or property, even when there will be no consequence for doing so, is not and can never be a Jewish thing. So what is the antidote to this that allows me to love Purim, even though I'm troubled by the conclusion of the tale of the Jews of Shushan that we read Thursday night and Friday morning? It is this. We only allow our minds to go there once a year on Purim as we read the Megillah's dark and violent end. We affirm without denigrating the story's importance because fiction is important that it is imagined, it is a projection. And most of all, it is the exception to a tradition that seeks peace and knows that revenge and even doubtfully justified hostility diverts us from the path toward peace. So one day, we will once again be able to see each other at the movies. But for now, perhaps we can keep in mind three redemptive lessons of an overall happy holiday. Jewish communities have at long last acknowledged addiction and affirmed that addicts are fully welcome to celebrations that will not trigger their lifelong struggle. And Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky helped us to understand this better than we ever did before. The diaspora can be a dangerous place, but it can also be a positive and creative one. While the choice is sometimes out of our control, we do have a role in building lives of blessing. And while we might sometimes fancy doing to them what they have done to us, outreach, community building, helping others where we can, and focusing on the blessing of peace for us and everyone else is a much more productive use of our time, energy, and Purim-inspired commitments. Shabbat Shalom. Continue with Musaf, which begins Chatzik Kaddish, page 155. Yes, Rabbi. Um, 